is filled with people talking of all manner of things under the sun, there's one topic people like to keep as a sidelined comment or avoid altogether. Drugs. They're a complicated topic in today's world where, boiled down, half the people want all non-sanctioned drugs eradicated and the other half want to enjoy their use. Where does this get really tricky? The gray area drugs. They're legal if prescribed, like narcotic-based painkillers and stimulants. However, they can be just as damaging as the illicit substances the laws of the land forbid. But because a doctor says it's okay to use them, go ahead! Yeah, just go ahead and follow the directions. At what point does it not become okay, though? How can the labeling of legal and illegal adversely affect everyone who's on these substances? Well, Darren Aronofsky tackles these questions in his infamous film, Requiem for a Dream. The poster child for trip hop editing, Requiem looked and felt unlike any other movie that preceded it. Its use of fast cuts intermixed with characters spiraling out of control with a claustrophobic focus made it an experience that's hard to forget, as much as many people wish they could. Most just watch it once and never feel the need to go back. But beneath it all, it's not the shock value of the material and the graphic depiction of decline that makes this experience noteworthy. What else can be dragged out of this emotional roller coaster? Let's climb aboard and find out. Oh, and as a side note, this review marks the third time I've seen this film. That's how much I love you guys. Meet Sarah and Harry Goldfarb, a shining example of positive family interactions. For instance, here's Harry stealing his mother's television to pawn it for dope money as she hides in the closet. I should note that this is by far their healthiest scene together. You see, it's part of their routine. He sells the television at a local shop, she goes and buys it later that afternoon. It's just a roundabout way for her to feed his addiction without directly giving him money. I'll remind you that this is them at their best with each other. By far. I'm harping on this opening quite a bit, but it illustrates so many things. The walk of shame with the television in front of his mother's neighbors, the embittered former cartel member looking down his nose at Harry's continued theft, and yet, what did these people do about his crime? Nothing, because the actual victim keeps letting it happen. Sarah's normalized her son's criminal behavior. It's a running theme in the film, too. Actions that become increasingly deplorable against our four protagonists they're approved by society at large. That's the most terrifying part of this movie. It's totally plausible within the world we live. So, that said, let's meet the other two happy souls. There's Tyrone, the streetwise dealer played amazingly well by Damon Wayans, and Harry's girlfriend Marion, played by a vacant Jennifer Connelly. Makes sense why they're all a little dazed, though. They're junkies. Completely. They're currently well supplied and in the money, so it's good times. They haven't hit their low point yet, and I don't think anyone really wants to see them get there. Because when you hit that rock bottom part of addiction, it's... it's rough. I'm better now. I can quit whenever I want to. The trio are making bank by dealing their product smart, cutting the right amount to make ample profit and increasing their cash box. They're using their substance of choice to further their hopes of achieving their dreams, putting everything on the drugs that define their lives. Let's hope the market doesn't crash. Well, what they're doing is actually better than what Sarah does. See, she watches TV. Lots and lots of TV. It's all she does, unless Harry's stealing it. Which makes that action all the more cruel. So, when someone calls offering her a chance to be part of a crowd on TV, she's ecstatic. Runs, tells all the neighbors, compulsively checks the mail for news of what show and when. She can't wait. She's going to be on her favorite thing left in the world. What show does she dream of being on?
said, we got a winner. Yeah. We got a winner. Yeah. She always watches this one, too, about looking good, eating no red meat, and generic health advice that claims to be a revolutionary system for making you a younger, slimmer version of yourself. And she wants to be immortalized on that stage next to the Juice by Juice guy. She's really fallen into an established trap that someone else has put out for anyone to fall into. So, let's go to the master trap maker and get his input on this. So let me get this straight. You want to imbue your M1 Garand with the spirit of Lenin, so you can kill he who wields the spear of destiny. That is without a doubt the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You know you need Rasputin's goatee for that, and there's the entire German army between you and Russia right now. DM, we're reviewing Requiem for a Dream. <laughs> because the drama of Gilbert Grape just wasn't dark enough for you, was it? Nope. Talk about the game show. The one hosted by the bad guy from Flubber? He's, he's done more than that. Steve-O's dad from SLC Punk? Better. Since the desire for drugs leads to drug use, Requiem had to find another goal for the non-junkie to pursue. Its answer came in the form of the daytime television shows. Sarah has lived life she's not exactly boasting about, but in one instance on television, her mediocre accomplishments will be washed away by having her name called. Whoever she is on that stage will represent to the entire world what she was. And she wants that image to be skinny. And how do you get skinny fast? With proper exercise and a moderated diet. Are you a public service announcement from the 50s? Maybe. Without the bright lights and 15 minutes of fame drawing her towards that goal, Sarah would have gladly spent the rest of her life making idle chat with the building neighbors and rebuying her television every time Harry stole it. But because someone planted it in her mind years ago, that fame is a good thing, she dives down the rabbit hole. What kind of civilization would have the social norm famous is good? Don't they realize the kind of damage that causes? So, uh, tr tr tread carefully. Encouraging what? people to make themselves well known to a wide audience does nothing to improve their own life. It just increases the likelihood that they're going to be miserable with it because they're spending all of their energies trying to make these small snippets for everyone to consume, ultimately to be forgotten. What's the point? Well, you did it. You decried the entire existence of YouTube. Oh god, I pulled a Seinfeld. Better repair the damage. Thanks, DM. And I really enjoyed doing this too. Oh well. Such a shame. Wait. Hmm. Mentions here that in lieu of Rasputin's stash, you can use a lock of Anastasia's hair. Really? I mean, come on. Why wouldn't you try that in the first place? So, Sarah's feeling great moving at a thousand miles an hour, while Harry's scaling the social ladder with the thousands he's making in the drug trade. They're both riding their respective highs, but here's where they start to crash. Society looks down on Harry and his friends because they're doing illegal drugs, which can be extremely harmful to a long and healthy lifestyle. The irony here is the substances aren't actually the problems, it's just the social and physical repercussions linked with the drug use that the trio finds trouble with. When a local dealer rivalry leads to Tyrone being caught in a police pursuit, it causes a money problem. Since all their revenue comes from peddling the product, and it's now in very short supply, they're trapped in a corner, desperate to do whatever it takes to get the drugs to make their lifestyle continue. Mind you, at least one of them is really hooked on the stuff, willing to do anything to get her fix. But it still falls into society limiting their options to get the high they want. Perhaps this is why the drugs are made illegal in the first place. But in a different world, their troubles would have been far less severe. Now let's see how the mother is doing with her doctor prescribed cure. <laughs> no, no troubles at all. Jesus. She's feeling things, having excitement in her life for the first time in years. The weight loss is important, but what becomes more vital to her was that sensation of being alive that the uppers initially gave. When she starts to adjust to the meds, her small apartment traps her in the end of a life she's disappointed in. And once that feeling of desperate loneliness starts to creep back in, she just ups the dose to keep herself engaged. My question is, how could the doctor not see this happening? I see you're a little overweight. A little. I have 50 pounds I'm willing to donate. We can take care of that. No problem. No eye contact. That, that would do it. He's a quack, doing his function as peddler without ever listening to his patient's actual needs. She wants diet pills, he's there to give them. Why cause a scene? It's once again the odd normalizing of something that makes no sense in the big picture. 
society enables Sarah to become hooked on this legally available substance, and it's gonna completely destroy her life. You can already see that. She's doing this to chase some pipe dream of being on television. Who would give up the rest of their life just to be in a crowd on TV? Someone lonely and desperate to give their life some meaning. They're all desperate to have their lives justified, to feel good and happy, using any shortcut they can to achieve that goal. The more desperate they become, the greater lengths they go to. Eventually, every character goes all in on a weak chance that ends up costing them everything. It's tragic, but it's the truth. That's the hardest part of Requiem for a Dream. We've all known, or some of us been, those people on screen making what feels like the right choice in the moment. It ultimately leads us down the wrong path. It's just heartbreaking. Requiem for a Dream will move you to levels you never thought possible. Elation at those highs and just depressing lows all in one package. I don't know how Aronofsky continues to do this, but this this was one of his masterpieces for a reason. If you haven't seen it yet and would like to experience something truly unique, I'd say give it a try. If you've already seen it, don't go back. Stay far, far away. It is totally not worth revisiting because you still have the scars fresh in your mind, even though you think the wounds have healed over. <sighs> I'm the other socio, and I need to hug a puppy. Since it's there for drug use, drug use leads to drug use. <laughs> to just cycle that way. <laughs> since it, actually, I think I was about to say since the dryer, since the desire of drug use leads to drugs. <laughs> <laughs> In the same sense that hunger leads to eating. <laughs>